Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to today's webinar titled Tech Financing, Unlocking IP-Based Financing in Nigeria. This webinar is organized by the law firm of Tokwe Adebayo LP, a law firm based in Lagos, Nigeria. My name is Musso Oke. I'm a partner at the law firm of Tokwe Adebayo LP and I'll be your moderator today. This webinar is particularly relevant because Nigeria plays a vital role in the African economy and its innovation ecosystem is growing rapidly with more entrepreneurs and startups developing new ideas and technologies. With the recent diversification of the Nigerian economy, the government has introduced several laws and policies to encourage science, technology, and innovation, underscoring the importance of the emerging tech se sectors in the economy. However, a significant challenge for entrepreneurs and startups is obtaining funding to turn their ideas into reality. Given the increasing interest in intellectual property as a source of financing and the expanding need for innovation in various sectors, this webinar seeks to explore how IP can be leveraged to drive innovation in Nigeria. Our goal is to offer valuable insights to entrepreneurs, investors, and policymakers. Before I introduce our panelists, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. Today's webinar is being recorded. We will be able to share a link with you after the event is complete. We welcome you to revisit the content yourself and share it with colleagues. Secondly, we also invite your comments and questions. Please type your questions in the Q&A chat box on your screen. I will post the questions to the panelists at the end of the discussion session, and we will get through as many questions as time allows. Finally, during the event, you will notice a survey pop up on the screen. Please take a few minutes to respond to the survey. We have an incredible array of panelists, and I will begin by reading a brief profile of each of our panelists. First, we have Dr. Emmanuel Okeleji. Dr. Emmanuel Okeleji is the co-founder and CEO of Seamless HR, a cloud-based HR and payroll technology company. Dr. Okeleji, alongside his team, has raised seven-figure VC funding to fuel the company's pan-African expansion. Dr. Okeleji's expertise and entrepreneurial background encompass various industries, including healthcare, agriculture and education. Today, he'll be speaking on the current state of the Nigerian innovation ecosystem and the challenges startups face in fundraising. Next, we have Professor Santa Wynn. Professor Wynn is the Pedantine Miller Chair in Law and the Director of the Asian Law Center at the University of Washington School of Law. She is internationally renowned for her expertise in the intersection of commercial law, financing, intellectual property, bankruptcy, licensing, and taxation, and has received international recognition for her expertise. Prior to joining the University of Washington, she held the General L. Beckel Chair in Law and was the director of the Center for Intellectual Property and Innovation at IU Robert McKinney School of Law. Additionally, she is a senior consultant for the World Bank and IFC on financial infrastructure projects in China, Vietnam, and the Mekong region, and has received numerous awards for her interdisciplinary scholarship, teaching, and mentorship. I am proud to say that she is my mentor and also my PhD supervisor. She is um, joining us from Seattle, Washington. Today, she will be providing an overview on IP-based financing and how it can be used to reshape the Nigerian innovation ecosystem. Next, we have Mr. Tunde Odumeru. Mr. Odumeru is a certified valuation analyst with over 20 years of experience yes. in valuation. He is particularly passionate about valuing intangible assets and the role of inter intellectual property in the nation's wealth. He started his career at Corporate Valuations and Valuation Consulting Limited, where he gained experience in value major, valuing major brands such as Boots, BBC, and Alcatel. He's now the managing director of Brand Finance PLC. 
Today, he'll be speaking on the role of IP valuation and the development of expertise in the field of IP valuation in Nigeria. Last but not the least, we have Dr. Shafiu Adamo Yahuri. Dr. Yahuri is the registrar of the Trademarks Registry. He brings over two decades of experience in the field of intellectual property law and, and administration with a specialization in diverse areas such as IP law and administration, examination, opposition, legal drafting, arbitration, dispute resolution, and international trade. Dr. Yahuri possesses a wealth of knowledge and expertise in this field. Today, he'll be speaking on the role of government and private sector organization in promoting IP-based financing for innovation in Nigeria. At this time, I'm going to be handing the floor over to our first speaker, um, Dr. Emmanuel Okeleji, who will be speaking to us about the current state of the Nigerian innovation ecosystem and the challenges startup face in fundraising. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Um, just to confirm if you can hear me, and you can see my screen as well. Yes, um, we can hear you, we can see us. Yes, we can. So I, just, I just first want to congratulate uh, Dr. Edivari LLP on your 15th anniversary. Um, our company is a very happy customer of Dr. Edivari LLP. Um, you know, you've been our supporters um, and advisors from day one, um, a bit over 10 years ago now. So it's a very long lasting, beneficial and fruitful relationship. And here's wishing you the next uh, 150 years of being a great institution. Um, I have um, 15 minutes to talk about the current state of Nigerian innovation ecosystem, um, the challenges startups face in fundraising. And uh, it's, uh, it's a topic that I live with, um, day in, day out. Um, I have had the privilege of raising money in Nigeria um, from, I think the first check that I raised was in 2012. Um, and this is really because that was the first time that anybody was interested enough to invest in a startup. Um, the startup ecosystem in Nigeria is, is still very, very nascent, very early um, relative to the rest of the world. I started my first tech startup in 2005. So it took seven years before I was even able to raise a small check of the equivalent of $20,000. Um, and that was, you know, at this time I was working as a medical doctor and, uh, you know, it was one of my clients in the hospital who actually uh, got to know that I was doing tech related work. And, you know, she, she just took a leap and put in $20,000 into it business, the startup I was running by the side while I was still practicing as a doctor. Um, but between 2005 and, and 2008 uh, in Nigeria, actually 2009, there was practically zero VC investment, at least 2005 when I started. Um, there was zero VC investment in Nigeria, zero. Um, friends of mine, uh, founders of one of the biggest is a unicorn um, startup in Nigeria now that started in 2004. They raised debt. There was no equity investment. The company is one of the biggest startups in Nigeria right now, in Africa right now. But when they started, they raised debt um, and equity from banks. So it was Nigerian banks who gave them equity in exchange for 90% of their company. Um, that was how bad it was. You know, imagine raising a seed round where banks have given you the equivalent of a uh, million dollars and have taken 90% of your business. Uh, so that was how bad it was. You know, it's like they literally doomed the business to fail. Um, kudos to those entrepreneurs who, against all odds, uh, built a unicorn from that business um, that, you know, they were sadly really bad at the beginning. Um, but that has transitioned from zero investment in 2005 from VCs to now, where in the last seven years before 2023, Nigerian startups have raised uh, approximately $2.5 billion, um, about 383 companies, uh, maybe let's say about 400 companies responsible for raising these amounts of money. Um, 
and I've employed close to 20,000 people. Um, so, you know, I've, I've had that privilege of being on both sides of the reality of like zero funding to now where, you know, a couple of billion dollars um, have come into the, into the, into the um, ecosystem in, in the last few years. So it's a lot of progress. It's a it's very, very stark difference between then and now. And we're grateful for the progress. Um, for instance, of this 2.5 billion, about half of that was raised in 2022 alone. So we saw sort of like a jump. If you look at the companies that were invested in 2019, 48, 2020, 85, almost doubling every year, 2022, 2021, 161. Um, and um, so, so there's certainly a lot of progress that the industry has made in fundraising. Um, and from 2020 to 2023 has also been very, very good, like the best years for tech in Nigeria. Um, you know, the, 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 all boats have risen with, or all, boat, all boats rose, as it were, with the rise we saw in tech investment um, during the pandemic and, you know, post-pandemic. So 2021, 22 was really good for Nigeria and as it was for the rest of the world. Well, 2020, 2021, some part of 2022. But we've also seen um, a reduction in investment, analogous to what's happening also in the world um, in 2023. So that's also drying up. But again, we're still way better than it used to be um, with investments in um, technology in, in Nigeria. A lot of progress has been made, but we still have a long way to go. If uh, you look at some contrast that I have here between Nigeria and India, one would say that India is a bigger country, but India is about four to five times the population of Nigeria. But the multiples, uh, uh, the differentiation between fundraising in India and Nigeria is um, more significant by, than the multiple of the population. Uh, and I'm very aware that multiple population is not the only way to look at this. There are multiple factors at play, but the contrast is clear. Um, in 2021, during the height of the boom post-pandemic, or let's call it a pandemic boom, um, India saw $27 billion in investment versus $790 million in investment in Nigeria. Um, of course, like I said, the rest of the world began to experience a downturn in 2022, but Nigeria still had a bump, a significant bump at that. In 2022, while India saw $24 billion in investments, Nigeria saw $1.2 billion in investment um, for a 20 times different differential between um, India and, uh, and Nigeria, and what used to be about a 40 times differential before. So that differential was sort of halved in the course of a year. Um, of course, again, that's too short a sample size to be able to make any solid inference, but the assumptions one can make is that the omens are getting better and better for Nigeria in terms of fundraising. Um, if you look at wider 2015 to 2022 time, time range, um, while India raised $136 billion in that time, Nigeria raised $2.5 billion. So overall, you still see a significant almost 50 times um, um, difference, over 50 times uh, difference in fundraising between both countries. But India is, um, I personally believe that India is the way to look for where Nigeria is headed. Um, a lot of similarities between both countries. And I, I feel that what has happened for African technology is that the coming together of the factors of production for the first time, probably in the history of mankind, where land, labor, entrepreneur, and capital has come together very well for tech companies in the continent. Like I said, when I started in 2005, capital was the missing piece. Um, but now capital has come in and African Nigerian businesses can now begin to innovate toe to toe with the rest of the world. Without capital, it was a struggle. Now that there's capital, it has also um, encouraged the increase in the other factors of production, more labor, more people now identify as developers and designers and engineers and all that. Um, so there's more labor, there are more entrepreneurs coming into the fray. Um, 
while I started in 2005, there was just a handful of tech, tech entrepreneurs in Nigeria. Now they're in their thousands. So, so all those factors have been catalyzed by the flow of capital. And I think that that's just great for the, for the country. So the, the story of fundraising in Nigeria is incontrovertibly positive. Um, I've also, just before I move on from this slide, contrasted that with the US $344 billion in 2021 to, so that's, you're talking over 400 times um, difference. Again, you know, it would be very, um, almost just um, oversimplifying the reality to compare Nigeria with the um, United States. So it's not a comparison, it's a contrasting, just so that one can understand what can be, what, what's possible. The US is less than two times the, the population of Nigeria. Um, of course, again, there are multiple factors um, that one will consider in comparing both, both markets together. In 2022, we also see that that fractional difference reduced significantly between Nigeria and the United States. So even while the rest of the world is winning, we still see that there's room for a lot of growth um, in Nigeria. I mean, the, the contrast to put is that they had startups in America that raised 1.2 billion, just one company could raise all the money that's raised in Nigeria in a year. Um, uh, in fact, way more than startups that raised $10 billion. Um, so um, we still have a long way to go but we have made progress. And I'm, I'm a very positive player in the Nigerian ecosystem. I, I decide to put on my positive spectacles um, and I'm just excited about the future. Are there challenges? Yes, they are bound. I will um, just speak about five of them. Um, there's that I think are unique and are interesting areas. I mean, the flip side of challenges um, is opportunity. And so again, like I said, my stance on this market is very positive. I'm long on Nigeria, very bullish in Africa. Um, and so even these challenges are, 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 are seen through the eyes of a, of a, of a very positive um, stand, standpoint, so to say. Um, so there's relatively low Nigerian h and um, participation in tech. Um, that has improved over time, but it's still relatively low. When I started, like I mentioned, Nigerian HNIs were not invested in tech at all. And if they did, they were going to ask for an arm and a, and a leg, literally. Um, um, for instance, when our company started, we, we raised $20,000 for 5% of the company. You know, and that's very, very unheard of today, where you know, $20,000 I, I, I now write checks and I invest in other startups myself and $20,000 will buy you, you know, maybe 0.01% of most startups now who are raising idea stage companies valued at $2 million. Um, then we are the product and we were valued at um, $200,000. So, or something like that. So the, or even less, I think that's we were valued at $100,000 or something like that. So the, the, HNIs, um, there's a lot of rich people in Nigeria, a lot of Nigerian billionaires. Um, you know, three of the top 10 black billionaires in the world are Nigerians living in Nigeria. There are more black billionaires in Nigeria than the United States. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of money and we, we will do better if a lot of that money is deployed to technology. Um, because there's context, this, this, this investors have context, they have connections, they have businesses, and, and, and there's just the country is going to get more value. So if you're raising money, you still go to your rich people in Nigeria, the h and in Nigeria, no one's giving you money, even now. You know, I've had friends who, it, one of my friends raised some money from a Nigerian billionaire, and three years in, this billionaire says he wants his money back, you know, and doesn't care where you find it, just give me my money back. That's still a reality today. Um, Big funds don't have an African thesis yet. Um, when I raised our Series A, um, 2021, um, I must have taken 130 meetings. And I'm not kidding. I actually have diarized all my meetings. I took over 130 meetings. Um, got a lot of interest from a lot of big VCs in the US, the General Catalysts, the Tiger Globals, and all these index capitals and all these folks. But they didn't really materialize because what I found in those interactions is that they don't have a Nigerian thesis, they don't have an African thesis, they're just, you know, guessing and 
no strong conviction on the continent yet. We ended up raising money from uh, Africa focused VCs or Global South focused VCs. Um, so the guys who really have the big institutional funds are not yet taking Africa serious enough. Um, and that's been my personal experience in fundraising and that of many of my friends who are also in this space. Um, Africa focused uh, funds are increasing, but they struggle to raise. I still sat with, a, with an investor in Nairobi yes, yesterday night. And we were talking about he's raising a new round and he was talking about how hard it has been for him to convince investors around the world about the Africa story. So the Africa Focus VCs struggle to raise funds. Um, of course, I mean, specifically on Nigeria, we have a poor Nigerian brand and PR. There's lack of significant fund exit success stories. So the, the, these funds don't have exit success stories to be able to help them, you know, raise money from new investors who are, you know, looking to maximize returns. Um, there's a lack of clear exit routes, routes for startups in Nigeria. Um, there, there's no, the Nigerian stock exchange is not a strong enough stock exchange um, as an exit route for the kind of multiples VC investors are looking for. And I can literally have a whole lecture on that topic, um, how the Nigerian stock exchange, you know, is not ready to, to take tech companies. Um, African private equity is quite small and they also don't have great success stories. Um, so from an exit standpoint, stock exchange is not a route. Um, private equity is not a strong route. m and activity within the continent is not very high and external companies buying African, uh, companies outside the continent buying African or Nigerian companies is also not very high. So investors are struggling to see how they're gonna get their money out. And because of that, a lot of uh, faith in, in investing in Nigeria still reduces the potential. But we can see that this, despite all of this, $2.5 billion have come in in the last seven years. And that's something to be happy about, but it could be 25 billion if we had clear paths for exit. And it's one of the reasons why I'm excited about the topic for today where there could be potential for exits through IPs that are, and, and stuff like that. We need more ways to, to help investors get their money out. Um, so what you find now is that most cash in Nigeria, or most cash in Africa are coming through DFIs. So IFC is very active in Africa. Um, CDC is very active. Propaco is very active. BIO is very active. Um, and, and so and, and they've been the main drivers of a lot of the billions of dollars that you have seen in the continent by far. Um, another challenge is that we've seen a few bad eggs. Uh, some big global firms have made bad bets on African startups and they've got their hands bond and, um, and they, they make bad bets because of course they don't have local context and they don't conduct as good due diligence as they could because, you know, um, because they just don't have local context. And so some of those investments have gone up in smoke already. Some are threatening to go down. And those things will have a boomerang. Well, they'll have not boomerang. They'll have a negative impact, more negative impact on the market because they're just exaggerated. You know, bad bets are made everywhere in the world. But because this is a very nascent market, those bad bets make, make things worse for us because then these big players stop writing checks um, in Africa and just makes things harder. Um, then, of course, the downtown related capital flights. Since the downtown decided in 2022, most of the big tech writers have closed their books on Nigeria, on Nigeria and Africa. Uh, again, because they were just, you know, taking dips and, and just um, playing around with the small checks here. And it's very, once, you know, the economy in the US started to um, have challenges, they just looked away from Nigeria, really. And so it's much harder now. We are, for instance, fortunate that we raise money when we raise money. Here's my last slide. Um, what I think the outlook for the future is, is growth is undeniable and will continue. Yes, there's a bit of, of a slowdown now. There's still enough dry powder focus on Africa to give growth, to drive growth and funding for years to come. When there was a jump in the markets in 2021, 2022, a lot of the African businesses went out to raise. So a lot of them still have some cash. There's probably still another two to $3 billion out there um, that needs to be deployed over the next um, maybe two to three years. And um, there will be fewer and fewer and fewer companies that will get this. Maybe they will buy those companies for cheaper and cheaper, but there's still money to be invested in Africa. And 
you know, markets are going in waves and hopefully the next wave comes before this money is dry out. Uh, a number of success stories will lift all boats. Uh, Paystack, for instance, exited to Stripe um, in 2020, and that really, really helped to, to catalyze the inflow of cash that we saw. And Flutter Wave also, you know, a bunch of unicorns being, being hatched in Africa, in Nigeria, has also increased interest in the Nigerian market. And that's going to continue. There are a few more unicorns, at least I know one unicorn that will be born this year in Nigeria. Um, and hopefully, Stainless HR will be a unicorn very soon as well. And, you know, these success stories will compound and, um, and we'll see more things going um, for the market. More and more Nigerian China is withdrawing their arts. I can see a significant difference between that now versus when I started. And, and they will be compelled to align with global best practices as they also get more sophisticated with investing in technology. Um, of course, they can set their own terms differently now because they don't lead those rounds any longer. So they are largely investors who are following um, rounds that are set or terms that are set by investors who are more sophisticated. So we're seeing more HNI participation and that's great, but there's still much more to do. There's too much money still locked in Nigeria that has not uh, found its way to tech. Um, government and local DFIs will join the fray more actively. The Nigerian government is leading the way with that. The Nigerian government, about a few months ago, two months ago, um, launched um, if a $672 million fund under the Digital Creative Enterprise Fund, BICO, in partnership with African Development Bank and the Bank of Industry in Nigeria. And, and that's a great one. That's like the first sovereign that is launching a sizable um, fund for tech. It remains to be seen how this is going to be deployed. I'm, again, I'm a big optimist on Nigeria, and I hope that the fact that BOI and AFGB are playing on this and other partners will make this a success. And you can imagine how much value that can bring to the Nigerian ecosystem. And right now, I'm speaking from Nairobi, where there's something called the Osla Fund that the new president of Nairobi has also rolled out to support upstarts in, in the country. So we'll see more sovereigns in the continent um, joining the fray and more DFIs in the continent joining the fray, which I think is good for the market. Um, Nigerian VCs are getting more and more, and that's also, and they're here to stay. Um, but this is the one I'm most excited about. New generation of founders will see the next generation. And like I said, I've started writing small checks, but it's, it's, uh, this is really, really exciting. Um, we will see the founders from the class of 2015 to 2017 are already writing checks. But as we also make major exits, for instance, the founder of Paystack is writing bigger checks, is, is an LP on some VC funds. That's great. You know, that's great. You know, I personally am extremely motivated to do this. Um, and hopefully we can make the next generation start on a way higher pedestal than, than we started. And, and that sort of like um, positive loop can continue um, for the continent. Um, thank you very much. Happy to speak more um, in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Okeleji, for that um, insightful um, outlook on the um, Nigerian innovation ecosystem. Next, I'm going to hand over to Professor Wayne, who will be speaking on uh, IP-based financing and how it can be used to reshape the Nigerian innovation ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mohsen. I will try to share my screen here in a second and hope you can see. You see the screens okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And hello from Seattle, Washington. And thank you to Ms. Mosen OK for the invitation here. So with the focus, with respect to IP financing, I'd like to share the US story. And let me put it in contact. It has been a very long journey. Um, even though many people think, that, uh, when they look at US, they think a success story. Uh, but from my angle of being a law professor researching in this space for quite some time, and that has been a very long journey to solve. Uh, why do I say it's a long journey it's here? Is that if you look back in the 1800s, uh, that's when you see the use of patents as collateral for loans. And in terms of uh, law at that time, there was no specific law that governing with, with respect to IP financing itself 
However, never, nevertheless, that you see here in these pictures, you have this gentleman, an inventor, an inventor is relating to his particular invention for fountain pen. And he and his wife, they used the patents and able to obtain a loan. And back in the 1800s, the loan was a big check, actually. It was $7,000. And it's not from a bank, it's from, it's from an investor. And so you can see right here, this very first story, the story relating to the willingness to accept IP as collateral, the willingness to believe that the inventors and the business models works. And so therefore investor willing to provide the financing and accepting patent as collateral itself. And then when you turn into copyrights and you will see that the concept of copyrights in mortgages, and you can see that even back in the 1909, you see that the check was quite big. So the debt in this, in this particular deal, there was $700,000 debt and the copyrights along with other IP trademarks included and in goodwill and also inventory as well. All of these assets owned by the debtor was used as collateral in the financing. So back then we call the copyright mortgages. Now, why I'm talking about the 1909? The 1909 is important because at that time, the United States, we revised the copyright law and the copyright law included at that time, 1909, the recognition that copyrights have been used as collaterals in, in backing loans. And so why this is significant? Because in the early 1900s, what we see the beginnings of the movie industries itself. And so the use of copyrights collateral help, helps to helps uh, helps uh, pace, uh, mapping out and developing the movie industry. And so if you see in the 1920s, you see a numbers of movies uh, was made and then you can see that here I have some of the old pictures here and that you can see all the way the increase and the growth of the movie industry. The movie industry could not could not happen in the United States without, uh, without copyrights used as collateral. When we talk about copyrights in the movie industry, we talk about distribution rights and how that distribution rights so important with respect to the financing in the movie industry. And so that's a concept of copyrights mortgages here. And then of course, then turn, the, uh, turn to the attention today with respect to after all this time from 1800s to the present time, what uh, have been in the last four decades in the, in the United States with respect to IP financing. And so when we look at IP financing, we talk about IP and tech com companies here, uh, but tech companies have different revenue mo mo models. And so we don't lump all tech companies in one space. And so depending on whether the tech companies that get VC backed or whether the tech company themselves uh, that able to generate some revenues. And so, and then uh, how IP in terms of the roles IP used not only for the VC backed companies, but specifically uh, for the uh, ven venture debt, uh, which, which are so important to start up without the venture debt. Uh, then companies will not be able to move to the next rounds of VC. So the roles of venture debt when they receive, when they need this kinds of, of, of capital or funds in between the VC rounds. And so when you look at the kind of venture debt deals and the roles IP, what you see is that Instead of taking the uh, accepting the IP as collateral, what we see in the venture debt space that negative covenants in the agreement itself. What do I mean by negative covenants? That's mean that the in order to protect the lenders here, and because the IPs are so important, and so therefore in the financing agreements uh, that the lenders prohibit the uh, borrowers from using the IPs in subsequent deals as collateral itself. And so pro, and now why that's important to the tech companies, the tech companies want to be able to up use IP in their op operation. And they do not want to use the IP and have the lenders to essentially take the IP as collateral. So, so therefore the inclusion of the negative covenants 
protecting both, protecting the tech companies and also protects the lenders here because the lenders know that, that the tech companies cannot take that IP, the crowd juice, uh, so, you know, the, the crowd juice here to use them in subsequent transactions. So this is really important to understand how the IPs are used in the in the venture debt itself. So of course that in venture debts that we know that uh, the uh, the loan, the loans amounts flow from the lender to the startup, but the stars are to pay for the loan amounts that of course they pay certain fees, but most, and then of course they pay back the, in, they pay the in, interest rates and also they pay the principal amount. But the keys here is that there's the warrants. And so the warrants right to purchase stock at, at a very low, very very, very low values itself. And so that's very helpful for the lenders because they will then be able to cash in. And so you can see that there's many different types of venture debts. And when we talk about them, they can be short-term loans, they can be revolving credit line, and of course, and of course, it can also be revenue-based loans as well. And then you can see that there's different terms. I will not go into details here. This slide will be made available for all of you to you to take a look at it and to understand how venture debt compared to different types of, of uh, lines of credits works in this, eco, in this ecosystem itself here. So when you look at the US tech companies with respect to the venture debt and, 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 and again, IPs is the drivers here. When I talk about venture debt, without the IPs, you're not going to be able to get the venture debts here. So you can see that the US tech, the venture debt, uh, the volume is very, very high. And okay? even with the, and, and, and also that I will argue that in fact, that when there's a downturn in the economy, the venture debt numbers increase. So you can see that in 2022, the venture debts increased by 29.2, right? So you can see that's a larger volume than any other prior years. And so, and then there are many, many different players in venture debt. So you can see P&E funds and different funds also jump into debt because that's where you see the uh, activities increase here, particularly in, in the downturn. And so what, so let's turn our attention to different companies. So Let's put aside startup. What about the mature legacy companies? The type of companies that have many IPs that have very robust, uh, large portfolio of IPs. And so what kind of lenders in this particular space and also how IPs are used in financing for these mature legacy companies here? And so you take a look at this, you see that there are different types of lenders and you see more of the uh, big banks uh, participate in this particular space versus in venture debt, you have different types of banks. Uh, so, so the big banks in, in this particular space here, and of course that they look at the uh, IPs, huge portfolio. So we're talking about it can be in the ten of thousand of IPs uh, in this in this kind of deal, right? And then of course uh, you can see that. Uh, loans backed by the IP access, uh, backed by the revenue streams. And of course, you can see that uh, the insurance companies also have a space, uh, have a space in, in this as well. And that you can see that the market has become quite sophisticated. And so therefore, lenders would like the insurance to provide some comfort. So you have insurance policies or insurance wrappers for these type of loans. And of course, the IP access here are all different type IPs and including the FDA clearances as well, particularly, particularly in the biopharma. And then you can see some of the players like Aon or Blue Iron or more. And then uh, of course, the big questions always um, you know, raised that what's the quality of the patents here? And so for some, some will argue that uh, most patents are not qualified uh, for loans. Uh, just a few patents are truly qualified for loans. So let's take a look here. So when I say that the big, big players in this particular space, and so you have very big banks from JP Morgan Chase to UBS, and they the one that plays in this particular space here that providing um, uh, uh, huge loans. And, and But these are for legacy companies that who borrow these monies here. So you can see, for example, um, more current data. Again, you see that Bank of America or JP Morgan Chase, 
and you look at the numbers of transactions that's backed by IP, and you see that there's a quite quite a lot of transactions in this particular space here. Again, these are for mature legacy companies. Uh, they're not the kind of startups here, okay? So you can see that Aon, as I mentioned, in this space here, that they provide valuation and insurance po uh, policies as well. And, and then here you can see that how Aon, um, uh, most of you probably heard uh, that they have a very, the Aon has a very large IP department in this uh, working in this space here uh, that providing the uh, valuation services uh, for lenders and also that provide policies uh, for lenders here to give comfort to, lend, to lend, lenders. So you can see uh, some of the uh, competitors. And so for example, with Blue Ions here uh, that uh, you can see that with their uh, very uh, big, uh, you know, nice present on the web, um, assault in that, you know, uh, they can provide loans anywhere from two to $50 million using IP as collateral. And so you can see that with Blue Ion, of course, that they um, provide information for startup and how to essentially walk them through the process itself of using uh, plans as, as collateral here. And, and then I know that uh, my presentation with the focus on the United States, but I think that it's also important to look at how other countries um, who came later in time, particularly China's uh, quite young in this eco space. However, uh, they have made an incredible progress. And I, and, um, I, I myself um, part have participated in many of the training in China to train uh, judges and also to train the uh, banking regulators in the use of IPs as collaterals in, uh, in financing. And so China, um, China, as we have seen, that they have been producing lots of IPs because once upon a time, uh, China was an economy that's essentially focusing on manual labor and produce uh, produce goods. Uh, but uh, but China has have turned to the quick understanding that um, that IP is so important. So China has manufacturing IP instead of manufacturing goods. And so in that context, then uh, what do they do with the IPs that they produce? And so they recognize that must you must accept and use the IP as collateral financing here. And so you can see that the effort just began in 2018. And so. In 2018, when the when the government embraced this uh, this this projects here, and as it was 5,000 transactions, very very quickly uh, within one year, that the number of transactions increased tremendously, and you can see that. 2020, uh, um, China provided loans of 22 billion dollars loans, and uh, when you look at who are the lenders here? So the banks and the credit unions uh, provided these type of loans, of course, backed by the governments here. And so you can see that the transaction in, in China has increased tremendously just nearly in the last five years itself. And because this is very new young projects and, and China learns a lot of lessons from the United States. They understand that in this eco space here, the focus also need to be looking at from the insurance model to give the lender the comforts. And of course, the governments also provide some of the guarantees with respect to the interest payments and also the principal payments as well. And so that's a, that's a very robust um, uh, robust activities in, in China is here. Um, and then we see in Korea, and careers, of course, that do, they do not want to be left behind. And so they uh, they try to also look into like, how they can leverage the IPs. And so we we'll see that the career IP office uh, that they um, they begun okay, and also grow quite fast in this particular space here. Uh, that's, cut, that's right now it's more than 2 trillion uh, wants in IP financing. When we talk about IP financing in Korea, we are talking about use, uh, using IP for loans and also loan guarantees by IP and also IP-based investment. So that's where we see with respect to, to Korea. And then the numbers of companies uh, that, um, for example, about young companies here, that they themselves that using the IP and obtain the loans, and as we that the survey in Korea uh, dem dem demonstrate that these SMEs here that they able to receive very favorable term loans for that. So 
with all of this, essentially to, to, to explain it to all of you that the story is still ongoing. And um, the story is not only a US story, now that other Asian country themselves have also followed and embraced IPs in financing. So with that, I turn over to you, um, most, most, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Wayne, for that um, interesting um, overview of IP-based financing, both in the US, China, and Korea. Uh, before I turn it over to our next speaker, please, I would like to reiterate that you can type your questions in the question and answer chat box. Next, we have Mr. Tunde Odumeru. He is a certified valuation analyst, and he will be speaking on the role of IP valuation and development of uh, valuation expertise in Nigeria. Thank you. We can't hear you. You have to unmute, sir. You have to unmute your speak. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Sorry about that. Yeah, thank you, Miss Oke. I think at this juncture now, the question we could be asking is um, what actually determines whether an IP has a sustainable and measurable value? Because because without a valuable IP, you really you have nothing. So these are some of the queries we we um, look at when we're valuing an IP. Some of them are very fundamental. You know, does a does are there is there rights owned to the IP? Does the owner actually own the right to the IP? This sounds like a very simple assumption, but um, you find from talking to a lot of entrepreneurs, um, especially tech entrepreneurs, you find that they built um, this technology, they built this product, but um, there isn't anything really protecting the, the, the technology. And the value of an IP, I mean, or an intangible asset really, is the exclusivity that it gives the owner, you know, um, to be able to generate, um, um, revenue or cash flows um, without being interfered with. So um, owning the right is absolutely crucial and very fundamental. Um, also, are the, are the rights recognizable? These rights, are they recognizable? And if you look at um, trademarks, for example, which is um, a form of um, IP, in fact, a very, very, very crucial, important part of the IP components. Um, this is one of the essence of brands. It has to be recognizable. Um, that's the only way you can distinct it from um, the competitor. You know, you can have the same products, but the brand is what actually distincts or differentiates um, um, the products, you know, in the eyes of the consumer. So, the, um, will the IP be useful to someone else? And again, we're talking about licensing rights here. Um, this is one of the all marks of IP, actually. You have to actually license this out to a third party user, you know, and um, get um, some earnings or returns from it. Um, and the last one, which is the most important, very important as well, is can it generate higher returns for the owner? when you actually license it out in form of a licensing fee or royalty rates. Um, in Nigeria, um, this is not really happening as such. This, um, these ways of um, exploiting IPs um, to, to get maximum value is not really happening as such. Um, I think this is, to, this is due to do with a lack of knowledge on the part of um, either both um, IP owners or even investors as well, which are encouraging um, IP owners to do such. So when, if all these things are intact, um, then you, you can have what is a valuable IP assets, you know? And the question, the next question would be, if you have these assets, how do you derive value from them? Um, because that, 
that's the whole essence of them to derive value to 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 exploit them to get maximum value from them no and to be able to do that you need to be able to identify them first because if you look at um tangible assets such as um, plants property and um, equipment um if you look at um tables chairs etc they are visible you can see them but um, in tangible assets you can't i mean you can see the legal document that a patent agreement is written on yeah, um, you can you can you can see contracts on the table in form of papers but there you you can't visibly see them as such they're intangibles you know they they are betrayed so this can create a problem for um especially small companies small startup companies you can create a, you can create a problem in trying to identify what these assets are you know and what you what usually will happen is um, a company will get a ip analyst or an ip evaluation analyst or an ip consultant to come and do an ip audit to help them identify their their ip assets but for a company or you can also value the business. More we are doing is value the business and differentiate between the balance sheet value and the fair market value. Because if you look at the balance sheets of um, businesses, um, the value, uh, the net assets usually represents the value. The net assets is the um, assets, less the liabilities. But when you value a company on the fair in a fair market value standard, then you find out the fair market value is usually higher than the, the net book value in the balance sheets. So what, they, what you could do is you can value the company. Then the difference between the book value and the fair value actually is a goodwill. That's what they call goodwill in accounting. You know, And you can now employ some professionals to kind of, um, because the goodwill actually have constituents that make it up of intangible assets. So you can now um, employ consultants to actually um, allocate each intangible asset within that goodwill. You know. But again, these are expensive exercises and time consuming exercises. So for a small company, what you can do is you think about what stands you apart from the business. You think about your key value drivers. What's actually driving the value in your business? Um, and these are unique to every business. It's not generic. So for example, now if you, if you, let's just take restaurants, for example. Um, the key value driver to the, that's driving the cash flow or the value of that business might not necessarily be the food that they're serving, even though that's the main reason why you go to a restaurant. It could be the ambience. It could be something else. So it's very, very, very important for founders or business owners to actually understand this. What's driving your business? What stands you apart from your competitors? You know, when you, when you write your business plan to pitch your investors, one of the most important um, parts that you have to, I mean, that you have to pitch rather is a competitive analysis. And in that, you actually talk about what stands you apart from your competitors. So you need to know this. What are your unique knowledges? You know, what are your expertise? How are your expertise being transferred into thought leadership? You know, and how is this thought leadership being transferred into intellectual property? The articles that you're, you're putting on your blog, um, are they copyrighted? Are they protected? So this, these, are the, these are the issues. What, what are the unique, what are the relationships with your clients and employees like? So th these are all intangible assets that you will not say stated on the balance sheet in the financial statements, but they're powerful drivers of value and they're powerful drivers of cash flows in the business. You know? So once you understand this, you'll be able to think of your IP in a way in which we enable you to maximum, uh, sorry, to maximize um, value out of it. Because this is very crucial. That's what the IPs are there for. The strategic assets, um, they're, they're not your um, tactical assets. 
the strategic assets that ought to be um, exploited efficiently. But like I said, you need to you need to know what they are, what it truly represents in, the, in your business. No. So once you know this, then you know the issue of finance can, you know, can come because what usually happens is that a lot of founders are actually um they concentrate on funding considerations. You know, they're preoccupied with that. The moment they build the, the, the moment they build the um, product, they're looking for funders straight. And they're not doing this housekeeping um, of trying to make your intellectual property intact, try to build intangible assets around the business so that you know you could um you, 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 that will help you leverage when you're trying to to, to fundraise. So the, que the question we could be asking here is, how do I leverage my IP when I'm in a fundraising negotiation? Or how do I transfer my intangible assets to, to, to finance? No. The, when we talk about um, IP in, in, in the context of finance, we usually focus on registered um, you know, registered IP, such as trademarks, patents, and design, or industrial design, if you like, you know. And they are important, but equally important are those who are registered as well. Um, the likes of trade secrets. In fact, if you look at fintech, um, if you look at the fintech sector, the trade secrets um, as an IP is a very powerful and important IP because that's what constitutes your algorithms. Um, so I can pronounce that word, Algo algorithms, does it? Um, your algorithms, your property formulas, et cetera. And these are things that drives, that would drive the cash flow in the business. So the, 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 the IPs that you can register are just as important as the IPs that you can register, you know? So there, there isn't, I mean, and again, it depends on the in industry because there isn't a general fit for all IP that's important for, you know, for, for, for a company or for a sector, if you're trying to raise, fi you're trying to raise finance, you know, it depends on each industries and what drives those, um, those companies operating those sectors. But if, if we look at the equity form of funding, for example, and, um, Dr. Nugent has talked about um, 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 venture debt funding or debt funding rather. So I will just concentrate more on the equity. I'll talk a bit on that as well. Mm -hmm. if, if you look at the equity form of funding, the structure usually is, um, and, I, and Dr. Kelechi also mentioned about that as well. The structure usually is that um, you, 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 you give a stake away in the business and you get funded. So the investor invests at a certain valuation point, which is known as a pre-money pre valuation, which is just purely the intrinsic valuation of the company, what the company is worth at the time. Okay, so they invest at that valuation point, but they, they expect you to scale in such a way which is even beyond market expectations, okay? And this is the basis on which um, you, 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 you get the funding. And companies have been able to do this. And there have been quite a number of companies, um, Dr. Kelechi mentioned, and Dela, and a few, Ope, um, Paystack, et cetera. They have been able to scale you know, at a valuation that's absolutely beyond market expectations. And the reason why they've been able to do this is it's all brought down to the, 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 the way they've been able to employ their intellectual property. You know, the, their innovative capabilities, the way they've been able to manage their intangible assets. So you can see how crucial um, in, um, your, in, your intangible assets or your IPR, you know, in terms of funding, you know, and in terms of your strategic planning as well. You know, it's absolutely crucial. So it, it gives, if, if, you know your, if you know your IP, if you know what is what, you understand it, you understand what it truly represents, then when you go to the negotiating table, you'll be able to negotiate well. 
and negotiate a higher valuation for your business to attract the funding. So, and a lot, quite a number of entrepreneurs have done this, but majorly, a lot of entrepreneurs have not done this. They, they, they don't understand the need to get their IP intact for this global fundraising. So this is this is a major issue. And again, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's due to lack of education. And there, there has to be a policy of educating um, all the stake all the stakeholders involved here in um, IP, you know, in the value of IP, especially not just for tech companies, even for manufacturing companies. I mean, we actually do um, in brand finance, where I run the Nigerian branch here. Yeah. We actually do studies every year of um, the most valuable brands, you know, um, and we just started doing the one for Nigeria um, in the last two years. And there's a metric we use, which is the enterprise value, um, then brand value ratio. So basically what it does is it's actually just compare what the brand value is to the overall enter enterprise um, value of the company. And you find that the, the, um, the brand value, the ratio is quite low to the enterprise value. And that's because a lot of companies are not really um, seeing, this, um, seeing this assets as a strategic um, assets that they are. And they truly are um, strategic assets that needs to be exploited. So with that said, um, I talked about equity, debt. Um, I think Dr. Guyen covered that. There's a strong possibility of using IPs as collaterals, but I've never seen that done in Nigeria yet. I may be wrong, but I haven't seen any form of transaction in that regard. But I think as the education of IP increases amongst other stakeholders, we begin to see more sophisticated um, approaches to, to funding, you know, using IP. One, one effective way of doing this as well, and I've, I have had um, requests for this a couple of times, is to use um, IP, especially in terms of copyrights, to securitize a loan or funding. So for example, if um, let's say family has a copyright of backlog, you know, albums or records that, that has been, you know, being released in the years and still any royalties from. Um, if they want to raise funding, they can actually use the backlog of those catalogs, who are the most valuable ones of them. They can use them to raise the funding. That will require evaluation of the catalog and to see what kind of royalty rates are being generated from those catalogs. So that can be done, that's an effective way. And I think that is beginning to happen in Nigeria. I've seen quite a few, um, um, a few deals nearly manifest, you know, so it's, it's, a matter, it's, a, it's a matter of time it will start happening. So with that said, um, how do we value this IPs? Um, the three, generally the three methodologies to Value. There are many methodologies, but they all converge around these three methodologies to value IPs. And the first one is the market approach. The second one is the cost approach. And the third one is the um, income approach. Now, with the market approach, simply what we do is we look at transactions that are similar in the market. Excuse me, they are similar to the assets that we've been valued, that we're valuing rather. You know, so the IP assets that will be valued, we look at the market to see if there's a similar um, um, if there's a similar IP in the market, and what royalty rates or licensing fee are they trading at? Um, licensing fee and royalty rates are kind of they use interchangeably, but they're slightly different. Licensing fees are outright fees you pay outright, and royalty rates are continuous you no know, fees. You know that you pay for the use of that. You know, so the problem with this kind of um, approach is that, you know, if you if you take a brand for example, 
no brands are the same. And I think I kind of mentioned earlier. So the same applies to all forms of IP. They're quite unique, they're unique assets. So it's very, at times it can be very difficult to find a comparable asset to use for your valuation exercise. So, <clears throat> but at times you do as well. No, but, it's, but apart from that, it's normally a useful way of um, valuing an IP asset. Then the next one is a cost approach. The cost approach um, basically just tells you <clears throat> how much is it gonna cost to recreate the same IP, to duplicate it or to replace it. So the problems with this one, of course, as well is that when you look at um, cost approach, um, it's really on the values of the business. And then the, the last one before I go, because I think my time is running out. The last one is an income approach, which basically look at the cash flow um, generated by the IP. And we look, at, we look at the growth rate and we look at the risk rates, which is called a discount rate. And we use that discount rate to, um, to bring back the IP to the present value. So thank you very much for that. Um, I still have a bit of speech to say, but my time is run out. I'll probably be able to say that, say what I have to say in the question and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dumeru. Uh, definitely, we'll still have time for questions and answers. Uh, I would like to crave the indulgence of the panelists before I invite Dr. Yahuri. Professor Wynne has to head out. Uh, she has classes this morning. And, and so I would just post one quick question uh, that we got from the chat box to her. And so that uh, she has craved our indulgence that she has to uh, take her leave. Uh, so Professor Wing, you spoke about insurance policy and insurance as an enhancer. And uh, I think the question is, can you uh, provide a bit more clarity on the role uh, insurance plays in uh, enhancing the uh, value of IP. Thank you. Thank you so much for the question. So first of all, the insurance com companies, they can do valuation of IP and quite a few insurance com companies themselves, they assert they have proprietary system that able to identify the values of the IPs and also to identify the quality of certain IP as well. So they so they give that comfort. So if you if if some if a lender uh, before they make a decision with respect to making a loan, uh, the lender might not have the expertise to be able to do the valuation of the IP. So therefore they turn to the insurance group. The insurance groups provide them with that. And, and then also then the kind of uh, policy that the insurance would like to, to sell to the lender. And so then the lender feel that the comfort with respect to when they make that particular loan to sell. And so um, in, one, in one way, if we think about it, imagine if the outside the IP context, if you compare to insurance on a house, that when you get a loan uh, from the bank, the bank insists that the homeowners have to have a homeowner insurance. And so different type of insurance uh, that, um, that lender themselves insist before they have, they going to have a lot, they going to willing to make a loan, right? So you can see that the insurance markets in the United States is very sophisticated mar market here. And also that when you compare to uh, China has also created new uh, new insurance models uh, that uh, that to to give comfort to the lenders in the event that when some things that's going um, not right and also that also that know from the from the front end that whether the IPs truly have that kind of values at all before they even providing the loans. So, and then the, the uh, Aons have details information with respect to the insurance policies. Uh, I can send over some of the slides that I have prepared for different presentation 
to go into more details about how Aeons, um, and also that I will also suggest yeah. that um, in the future, it can also invite um, Aeons and Blue Ion to speak about their insurance models uh, with respect to what they have been selling to lenders here. And also that the governments, how they also work with insurance modeling companies like in, in China to provide a comfort. So there's quite a few products uh, that they're providing, but at the front end, always, like I say, they have to conduct the valuation and selecting the quality of the IP. Thank you so much, Professor Wayne. Um, you can type your questions for Professor Wayne in the chat box and we will send it to her and uh, we will also forward her um, the answers to you. Thank you so much, Professor Wayne. I know that uh, you have to leave and hopefully we will still have um, sessions where we would invite Professor Wayne to talk more about um, IP financing. Next, we have Dr. Yahuri. Dr. Yauri is the Registrar of the Trademark Registry. And like I said, when I was reading his profile, he brings over two decades of experience in the field of intellectual property law and administration. Today, he's going to be speaking on the role of government and private sector organization in promoting IP-based financing for innovation in Nigeria. Thank you, Dr. Yauri. Thank you very much. Now. The concept of security over IP asset is certainly not new, and particularly in Nigeria. The first speaker has uh, really uh, elucidated on that, showing the over 2.5 to 3 billion US dollars investment in that area, and with over 400 to 500 uh, enterprises in Nigeria engaged in this business. And this is what I call as a result of the pro-IP era of the last 30 years, which is characterized by steady growth in IP filings across the world, and uh, also greater use of uh, uh, IP by businesses. Uh, certainly, as you are all aware, from the uh, first industrial revolution characterized by typewriter, I mean, printing, press, and the second industrial revolution by typewriter to the third by computers and internet and to now the fourth uh, industrial revolution by um, uh, 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 artificial intelligence, there has been sustained and growing importance of uh, intellectual uh, property uh, rights as a factor for production. Uh, like also the first speakers, uh, talked about, he mentioned the issue of the factors of production in the past being land, labor, and capital, and today knowledge being the center stage. Hello? Hello? We can, we can hear you, sir. Thank you very much. And today, knowledge being the center of uh, 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 the economy. So the value of farm today is determined by their intangibles brands, ideas, technologies, and what have you. Now, this also uh, confirms by various scholars that uh, of the value of farms are now based on their intangibles uh, assets and 20% on the Uh, Coca, the totality, the entire investment of the Coca-Cola company uh, on the uh, tangible terms, the building, the machines, the cars, and all the movable assets put on one hand in terms of value. If you put the word Coca-Cola as an intellectual property is far greater in value than the totality of the assets of that company. And this is just one good example on that trademark. Well, the society also has shown us that recent trend uh, has really put IP at the core and at the center of economic activities of today. And therefore, government is working to boost uh, awareness on intellectual property and the importance of protecting intangible uh, uh, assets. 
and also fighting counterfeits and uh, also fake uh, products. And this is happening all over the world, and in particular in Nigeria. Um, this is to further buttress the importance of the intellectual property as a system. So therefore, uh, this issue of corporate finance, uh, uh, specifically focusing on bankrolling new ideas with a view to maximizing profit and uh, using intellectual property as the collateral is something that has been in place in Nigeria for quite some time. Government is therefore uh, working uh, to come up with a draft framework. The idea of this framework is to provide a guideline, a financing scheme that will ensure a formalization of the IP financing scheme in Nigeria, which has been in operation for quite some time now. Uh, the framework will provide a security uh, uh, system assurance that will uh, ensure that lenders uh, are protected and also the borrowers get uh, the financing that they require. And this, uh, a draft will soon be out because a committee with cross uh, uh, cotton membership is working on this. And I think it will be uh, uh, an opportunity where the various stakeholders will have a look at the draft and also provide useful comments on the framework in order to ensure that we have a formalized system on uh, 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 IP-based financing in Nigeria. And if successful, I'm sure it will provide a significant step forward by uh, ensuring that inventors and entrepreneurs have now a formal option of accessing loans and also uh, with clearer uh, rules and guidelines for doing so. And I thank you very much for providing me this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Yori, for that very insightful uh, breakdown of, in the area of uh, the laws and uh, policy. I must say that I agree with you about the fact that the Nigerian government is uh, working assiduously to create framework around um, IP financing, particularly with the introduction of the STMA Act, the Secure Transaction and Movable Asset Act, and uh, the, the recent Startup Act. So a uh, um, couple of policies that um, the government have uh, passed recently. And um, thank you very much. I have a few questions uh, for the panelists and uh, because we're trying to stick to time. And I know that a lot of you have um, busy schedules. Um, the question I have here is for Mr. Dumeru. Uh, the question is, are the IPs in Nigeria really valuable? to be a basis for tech financing. Can I read it again? Should I read it again? You have to unmute, sir. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, please read that again. Are the IPs in Nigeria really valuable to be a basis for tech financing in Nigeria? Yes, um, that's a good question, actually. As I mentioned earlier in the, in the first part of my, of my talk, um, there are certain things that determine um, whether, uh, whether an IP is valuable or not. You know? um, there, there's the internal, which is, what I, which, which is what I mentioned, but there's also an ex external aspect to it. Um, and that, the, the external aspect in it, in it is to do with the legal the legal framework in which IP operates in Nigeria, um, or shall I say, the, um, how enforceable IP rights are. Um, if IPs are enforceable, like any other countries, you know, well, actually, usually they're not they're enforceable, but they take time to 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 enforce. But th this does not affect the value, you know. The IP really is the value of the IP is basically what the um, the it's the intended user intends to do with it. So from that perspective, there will always be IP 
I mean, there will be value in IP. But um, as I was mentioning earlier, the legal framework actually plays a big role as well in determining the intrinsicness of value in IP. I hope that answers the question. Yes. Yes. It does. It does. Thank you very much. Um, I think the next question is for Dr. Kelechi. From your experience and having raised funding, what role did IP play, uh, play in the fund raising? Because usually for equity investors, when they value um, a startup, they usually do not separate the IP from the company. It's usually uh, a valuation of the entire uh, business itself. What role did IP play specifically during the, the process of fundraising? Thank you. Um, so I, I just want to confirm if you can hear me and if you're not getting too much noise from my background. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. So um, IP unfortunately didn't play much of a role in the in the letter of our evaluation, but it did play a role in the spirit of the evaluation. What I mean by that is the what was valued was the power of our product to be able to win market share. And the investors did spend time looking at the product. In other words, if our product was not superior, we would not have been able to raise the money. So on, on those on two levels, so they looked at the product and confirmed the superiority of the product. They got technology consultants to you know check at the product and confirm that the product is superior. So to that extent, IP was valuable. And the second being that the you know the ability of that product to achieve what is called product market fit, that customers are buying and paying for this product, um, was also taken into consideration. I think that as the industry matures in Nigeria, we will begin, we will begin to see innovations that are worth being valued. But at still this early stage, it's still like market-driven valuations that you see, or, or just equity valuation based on balance sheets and earnings and, and, and EBITDA and revenue and, and, and stuff like that. Thank you, Dr. Um, I have a question for Dr. Yawri. Uh, I'm just curious to know the effort government is making in synergizing uh, the agencies of government. For example, we have the STMA Act that creates the collateral registry. And I'm aware that the section of that act uh, talks about um, synergizing the uh, individual intellectual property registry, including even the companies, um, the corporate appears commission, <clears throat> a collateral registry, so that it's easy to have a seamless uh, collateral registry where um, financiers, uh, just by a click of um, the, the system, can check if uh, an IP has been uncovered. So I'm, I just want to get your take. Is there an effort by the government to synergize this registry? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Before answering this question, I just want to add one or two points on the issue of the uh, value of IP. Or well, in my brief presentation, I've cited the issue of the Coca-Cola. But coming to Nigeria, let's take Dangote, for example, which is a well-known brand, or Glow. Uh, for telecommunications. How, how can anybody imagine that these two uh, uh, brands are of no significance or value? Let's move to patent. The ESAT, the, the inventor of ESAT is a Nigerian, a medical doctor, a military man who has won a World Intellectual Property Organization Award for his device that assists accident victims or people who are losing blood to get that blood back into their system immediately after an accident or any incident that involves blood coming out from the body. Now, these are valuable 
uh, uh, brands that can stand the test of time. And I can cite many, I can cite many in the area of the tech, uh, financial tech industry and so many other areas in Nigeria. Coming to the question, yes, it's a very good question. There was an attempt uh, under uh, the presidency of Olusegun Obasanjo to have one single umbrella intellectual property body. However, uh, the Nigerian Facto uh, came in. Those from the copyright area said, look, we are not industrial and therefore we may not be uh, uh, at home with a single uh, agency. And already we are a commission, Nigerian Copyright Commission. So why do we need to be in another commission? You that are yet departments under the government, get yourself organized and be a parasitical a commission. Then later on, we can job. But whatever happened is now history. I believe it is the best way to go. If you go to South Africa, we have the Companies Registry and Intellectual Property Office. So why don't we have a good example in Nigeria like that? Have the Corporate Affairs Commission now merged with the Intellectual Property Office, both copyright, trademarks, patent, coming together under one umbrella. That will be good for all. However, I pray that within the framework that government is tinkering with or thinking about, we will now have uh, an omnibus uh, framework that will work that out. Already, using doctrine of necessity, this country has brought so many new ideas to the world. We have what is called a one-stop shop at the Nigerian Investment Promotion Commission. When you go there, you have various agencies, including immigration for visa, station at the uh, particular desk in NIPC, where you can get, you have CAC there, you have all these agencies represented there. So this is one other way of finding a way out of the solution. If having a single umbrella intellectual property office is not feasible or it's not working, and government is not interested in having such. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yahuri. That's that's really, really um, interesting and uh, informative. I think um, my final question will go to uh, Mr. Odumeru. Um, I've had the opportunity to sit down with um, um, bank um, lenders, people who work within the uh, debt finance and, uh, industry. And one of the challenge they have identified is valuation. Now, one, cost of valuation and the absence of secondary markets for IP. And uh, from your experience, you've been valuing um, trademarks and a couple of IPs for some years now. And like Dr. Yauri said, we do have valuable brands in Nigeria. He gave an example of Dangote, uh, and a uh, couple of uh, banks and also uh, within the tech um, sectors. But so it, my question is, is it necessary to develop in-house ex expertise uh, within the banks for them to really understand? Because in your uh, presentation, you spoke about uh, information gap and which is true. There's an information gap between the owners of the IP the lenders and probably government to a large extent as to how to go around valuing IP because globally there's no standard method of valuing IP. Uh, I think the market has just come up with a couple of uh, the methods that you have mentioned, which is cost method, the market method, and the royalty uh, method. Uh, so um, given the challenge for increased cost for the banks, is it better for them to have in-house expertise as valuers in the bank that can value IP or the relevant IP registries should um, hire and train valuers uh, who would work in the registry so as to maybe save costs? I, I hope you've got my question. You're muted, sir. Okay, yes, I think, I think I've got your question. First off, if you have in-house values, it compromises the independence of the valuation because um, there, there might be a conflict of interest. So it's almost, it's, it speaks well when you have an external valuer to value the, the, the brand. 
Then what was it? What was the other bit before that? Sorry. I asked whether uh, we should uh, we should have um, valuers situated in the relevant IP registries who would help with valuation rather than have the banks train valuers and hire valuers because their concern is cost. And yeah. uh, I think the second question I asked about the lack of secondary market to be able yeah. to dispose of this IP. Well, the, 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 the IPs are not known for buying and selling, to be honest. You seldom find um, the sale of IP in the secondary market. What they, what they normally do is the licensing. Um, um, they normally license the IPs. And um, with regards to um, the question with the trademark valuing, um, in-house valuers would not, it will affect the um, independence of the valuation. You, you again, I'll say you need an external um, valuer to value those um, assets. Because it, it's kind of tantamount us to say that if you have um, to do an audit of a, of a company or even a bank, um, having the internal auditor or the CFO do the audits um, would, 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 would kind of affect the independence of that audit. You know? So um, I think it's almost better to have an external valuer to, to do this. And a lot of banks are doing this, actually. Um, the, the top five banks are actually valuing the brands on, a, on an annual basis. Um, well, not all of them, but most of them, you know, and they're giving this to um, external valuers to do, you know. But I, I also agree with you that the training for IP valuation is absolutely crucial, you know, and if you have um, people in the IP registry that can do it, just as you have people in the tax office who do tax audits and are trained to do tax audits, then that would be a good thing as well. I, I think that might not be a bad thing, but um, I'm also thinking of um, the possibility of compromising when there's too much relationship between those guys in the IP registry of, uh, office doing the valuation and the, and the organizations or the brands they're meant to be valuing. So in the long run, I think it's almost better to actually have an independent valuer come and value the brand or the IP. Thank you so much, Mr. Dumero. Thank you uh, to our panelists. Thank you, Dr. Yahuri, for your time. Thank you, Mr. Tundo Dumero. Uh, thank, thank you, you to Dr. Keleji. I know he had to uh, drop off. He had a, uh, a meeting. Uh, thank you also to Professor Wayne. And thank you to all the participants. A poll just is just uh, on your screen. Please take out time to uh, answer uh, the survey. Uh, we really appreciate um, your time. And I just want you to know that you this is not the last webinar you would be uh, um, getting from Top by LP. This is a continuing series because um, in this space of innovation, we do realize that IP plays a very significant uh, role. So we'll be sending you information about our webinar series. And uh, once in a while, we would have a physical um, symposium or, uh, or seminars. Thank you once again. We will send the um, recordings to everyone so that you can listen to it and share with your uh, colleagues. Thank you once again and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. What time did we finish? Yep. The results. The time.